objectives are going to cover the same ones that we're kind of been repeating throughout the semester. So describing the mechanism of action, describing the therapeutic use, side effects, patient teaching, um, nursing considerations, um, complications, and applying the nursing process to each one of these types of medications. Um, the first group of medications that we're going to go over for GI are going to be peptic ulcer disease medications. This comes from your ATI chapter 28. Okay, so the purpose of the peptic ulcer medications are going to be either um, an antibiotic to treat what's going on, uh, like a type of infection that's going on to cause the ulcerations, and that's usually due to H. pylori, um, or to promote healing in the GI tract. And there's several different kinds of ways that these medications are going to be um, promoting that. Um, the goal then is, of course, then to reduce their manifestations of these um, ulcer symptoms um, and promote healing, prevent complications, and then, of course, prevent reoccurrence of it from happening. So the first type of these medications are, of course, going to be then the antibiotics. So these are going to be like your amoxicillin, clarithromycin, metronidazole. It, um, You'll see that one a lot in practice, it's flagell, um, and then tetracycline. Uh, these purposes, of course, again, are gonna be to kill that H. pylori bacteria. The common adverse effects from these are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Uh, it's an antibiotic is my only excuse for that. Um, so uh, education for the patients are gonna be also related to being in the antibiotics, so taking the full course of therapy and administering with food to decrease that kind of GI distress. Um, their therapy is gonna be about two um, or three antibiotics at the same time though. That's a little bit difference here with um, treating GI disorders that we usually compound them. And so there's less resistance because we can get it um, kind of killed and back down to lower levels over a shorter period of time. And so usually about two weeks for any antibiotics, but we're going to double or triple them up during that time frame. The second type of medication that we're going to be using are um, histamine 2 receptor antagonists. I'm trying to get the glare off of my glasses. Um, so the histamine receptor antagonists, these are going to be the renantidine, famotidine. We're, you'll see these um, more sometimes you'll see famotidine in the hospital and um i gave it a few times in the emergency room for um just really bad um, gi distress that they had so much um, nausea and vomiting that they you know once you get to the certain point of so much vomiting that you just have all that acid build up so this kind of helps decrease that acid build up so prevents that gastric um and duodenal ulcers um, GERD, hypersecretary conditions, so they're secreting so much acid, um, heartburn, and acid indigestion. Um, used in conjunction with antibiotics usually in order to treat ulcers that are caused again by H. pylori. Um, so complications of these medications are going to be um, blocked androgen receptors and CNS effects for um, the semetidine but then constipation, diarrhea, and nausea for renidine. So these are kind of separated. They don't apply to all of the medications, but um, that blocked androgen receptors, they're gonna be, um, they're gonna be like androgens, like sex hormones. So they're gonna have a decreased libido, um, gynecomastia and impotence um, make, can occur with these. Of course, we're hoping this is gonna be a short-term therapy. So hopefully it won't affect them that much, um, but it may become an issue if they have um, stress-related ulcers and they're on long-term therapy, that's when they might get into this um, issue. And so we'll really need to watch out for these um, <clears throat> over long-term. We can give ranitidine and famotidine IV um, only in acute situations though. Um, it's just a little irritating to the vein. Um, most times we want to stick with the PO route and so that because it's treating what's in the GI tract. So it gets more directly to that area. Um, education we want to give these um, patients are to avoid alcohol and foods that de increase GI irritation like spicy foods and things like that um, and notify their doctor for any coffee ground emesis. We've talked about a little bit before about coffee ground infamous, but not really a lot. 
that's um, usually used due to a bowel obstruction or um, a GI bleed. And so they're actually vomiting up this black tarry emesis um, that is, or coffee ground like seedy like coffee grounds. Um, so that's a complication and we definitely want them to make sure that they report that uh, to their doctor. Also, they need to increase their fiber and fluids um, to prevent constipation, um, which is a common side effect of a lot of these medications you'll see is constipation. There's just a few that cause um, the opposite. So um, pay attention to the differences there. Um, of course, we need to adhere to the full regimen in order to prevent reoccurrence, and they need to avoid smoking as this can delay hearing, healing, um, which every doctor will tell you that it slows the healing process. Um, and so it's going to slow down the healing process of the ulcer if they are also smoking in this case. The next type of medication are proton pump inhibitors. So this um, includes omeprazole and pentaprozole. Those are the most common ones that you'll see prescribed or in the hospital. Um, it's usually the first line of defense to prevent um, acid buildup or um, reflux. So it inhibits that enzyme that produces the acid itself. So it's more directly um, acting on it. Um, usually we want this as a short-term therapy though. So only about four to six weeks. Um, when treating ulcers, um, but long-term therapy, we can have this me these medications for like hypersecretory conditions, again, where they're secreting additional acid than they're supposed to, or prevent um, stress ulcers for clients that are at risk for developing continuous stress ulcers. Um, complications of proton pump inhibitors are going to be pneumonia, um, osteoporosis, and stress fractures. Um, so osteoporosis is that breakdown of the bone, so then that can lead to stress fractures just over this simple thing, such a trip, and they can break their ankle. Um, <clears throat> rebound acid hypersecretion, so we're taking it for secretory issues, and it may um, rebound and cause an opposite effect. So we do need to look out for making sure that the medicine is actually helping them or changing them, not just adding another medicine. So that's where this one plays into the effect. Sorry. Um, then other issue is going to be so many messages. Um, issue that we're mainly going to watch out for are the hypomagnesium. So especially with long-term therapy on this, we need to monitor their magnesium levels and looking for C. diff-associated diarrhea. So this is where this is one of those differences where it's going to cause the diarrhea. And so it's um, that C. diff, which is normal flora in your intestines kind of gets overrun and then that causes the diarrhea symptoms um so we hypo let me see how i want to say this hypomagnesium so is low magnesium levels um but let me see tremors Muscle cramps, seizures, it's kind of like calcium. They kind of go hand in hand, and that's where I kind of get them mixed up. So I was trying to remember how um, they go. So they need to monitor and report for any of those symptoms for tremors, muscle cramps, and seizures. Um, we need to monitor their magnesium level throughout the therapy. Um, and cramping is going to be more of the first sign, okay? Um, considerations. Uh, these proton pump inhibitors are going to need to be used in precautions with uh, patients with dysphagia. So if they're not able to swallow very well and they get it stuck, then it's starting to proton pump inhibit in their esophagus. And so that could cause actually ulcer there when it's supposed to be preventing ulcers down below. And so um, we want to make sure that they are able to fully swallow. Also, we need to monitor these um, medicines in patients who have liver disease um, or taking digoxin and phenytoin. Um, and then pantoprozole, if we give it IV, can cause a lot of irritation to veins. Um, phlebitis, I've seen um, this happen, actually. So 
you have to be very careful when you administer it. You can't just push it back um, into small veins. You have to make sure that you have a very patent vein and the flush afterwards is the main thing. So it's not just sitting in that area of the vein. Make sure that you're flushing afterwards. Okay, um, again, for education, monitoring for that coffee ground emesis, that they're not vomiting up that um, coffee ground emesis. Um, they need to take the omeprazole prior to eating in the morning. Um, you take it before a meal so that you have less acid for when that meal comes, that you're not overproducing acid necessary for that meal. And so that's the issue is that they're producing more acid than what's required to break down their meal and then everything refluxes and they have this condition that disclosed from there. So um, I have reflux, so this is my issue. And um, so a lot of my issue with taking my medicine is taking it ahead of my meals. I remember when it's time to eat and then I'm like, ah, so I take it like with my meals, but really you're supposed to be taking it an hour or more before your meals in order for it to get the best effect from it. Okay. Um, and these can um, have a decreased effectiveness of other medications because that's how your stomach takes in other medicines is through proton pump inhibitors is by breaking down the other medicines. And so if we're inhibiting that acid pro production, then other medicines aren't really gonna be absorbed as well as they initially would have without an inhibitor. So you got kind of think about, because we, we do need the acid to break down our food and medicines, but if we're inhibiting it, then we might not get the full effect of other medicines that we take. So we do need to be mindful of that and um, even maybe take them separate from other medications. Um, we don't think about this a lot because we give pantoprozole to practically every patient in the hospital. They get it IV. Um, just about everyone gets it just because their food um, regimen is being changed. So it's not in their normal diet that they're used to at home. Or they might be NPO for prolonged periods of time. So that acid production is most likely to happen because they haven't eaten in so long. Um, so we put them on the pantoprozole. But then we give them a bunch of other medicines to take by mouth. And we give them pantoprozole IV. So we still need to be um, mindful, especially if it's PO, though, is the issue. So omeprazole, if they're already on omeprazole at home or taking it as a new prescription, that it does interact with other medicines. So taking them separately and before meals is key. Okay, so the next group of medicine medicine is um, mucosal protectant, which is sucralate. Um, it's really the only one that I know of that is like this. So these are the medicines that provide that barrier. So it goes down and adheres to the wall of the, at, the ulcer in order to um, relieve and kind of have a barrier there um, so that when then they eat, the acid isn't hurting and irritating the open active ulcer anymore. So they have pain relief and then that allows the ulcer to heal on its own instead of continuing to be eaten away with acid. And so these provide that protective barrier and it adheres to the ulcer, but it gives them relief only for about six hours. So this is when they're having to take it on a regular schedule. So um, this is why they typically are taking a QID, so four times a day. So one hour before meals, again, before you eat, is very key point with the most of these medicines. So an hour before each meal, so that's three meals, plus the one time before bedtime. So then there's your four. Um, considerations, caution with these medicines in chronic kidney disease or diabetic patients um, is just not absorbed correctly and can um, really cause constipation more so. Um, the main complication of this is constipation um, just because it covers everything and so it kind of slows down the process of um, breaking everything down. And so if everything slows down, then you're less likely to have bowel movement, so then you're having constipation. It's just the process that it has. Um, but really, uh, we can counteract that by increasing their fluids um, and increasing their fiber um, intake uh, to prevent that constipation, okay? 
Um, these uh, sucrophate also interacts with other medications, so taking them separate from other medications at least 30, for, 30 minutes before any antacids, because antacids work a different way, so we um, don't interfere. So another key thing you'll see are a lot of these interact with antacids. So we need to be mindful of not only other medicines, but other GI medicines that we're taking at the same time. So it's gonna ha these medicines are gonna play a lot in how often in the regimen and being mindful of their entire medication list. Okay. Um, they can break or dissolve, but don't chew or crush these medicines. And they of course need to complete the entire course. Their course is um, designated for however long that they believe that their stage of how bad their ulceration is in their area, um, of how long they believe that it will take to heal. As long as we keep that covered and barriered up, then um, it should heal on its own. <clears throat> All right, so prostaglandin E analogs. Uh, this is mis misoprostol. Um, these decrease the acid secretion and increase the bicarbonate and protective mucus production. So it's kind of like an all in all kind of thing um, and promotes vasodilation to promote blood flow to the area, therefore getting better outcome and better um, action of the um, absorption process. Jeez, I couldn't get that word out. Um, and so it's used to prevent gastric ulcers in clients with long-term NSAID use. So patients that are on long-term NSAIDs, like patients with um, uh, musculoskeletal disorders um, that are having to take those as part of therapy just to have a normal daily living, um, they're of course at risk for those GI bleeds. So we can give them a prostaglandin um, medication and kind of prevent that gastric ulcers um, that may cause the bleeding later. Um, complications though are going to include diarrhea, dysmenorrhea, and spotting. So that's an abnormal um, menstrual cycle. Um, so it's very important for clients that are taking these, you know, female clients, that they must not be pregnant. These actually um, federal guidelines require a verbal and written warning prior to taking this medication and having negative pregnancy tests. Doesn't matter if you've had your tubes tied, they will test you for pregnancy in order to start taking this medication. So, um, and then they must, um, uh, what's it called? Um, <clears throat> promise to use alternatives to contraceptives, and um, they can't start this medication until their second or third day of their cycle to try and and hopefully not have as bad of um, menstrual cycle pain as possible. Um, in infants. Uh, if the person is breastfeeding during this time of taking this medication, it can cause diarrhea in the infant. So really shouldn't do it while you're breastfeeding either. Um, so they should take these with meals or at bedtime. Um, just, yeah. Take it at bedtime. All right, so the next set of medications are going to be covering gastrointestinal disorders. So this is from chapter 29 in your ACI book. Um, the purpose of these medications are going to be to treat or prevent nausea, vomiting, not motion sickness, diarrhea, or constipation. Treat GERD um, by either increasing the gastric motility, protecting the stomach lining, or inhibiting secretion of the gastric acid. And then also to treat hyonal hernia by controlling the reflex. Um, so then the goal was to reduce or rid of the manifestations of the disease process. So the first type are going to be antiemetics. So 
emesis as in vomiting. So this is to try and prevent vomiting. So a common one you'll see here is ondocitron, that's Zofran, um, and metoclopramide, promethazine, and hydroxyzine. Um, one that is used less often is the lorazepam because that is a benzodiazepam. Um, but it does have that side effect that it can help um, inhibit the urge to vomit sometimes when you're at your wit's end and nothing else is working for your patient. Um, so these are going to prevent and treat nausea or motion sickness um, due to different causes. Um, there's listed different ones in your book about like chemotherapy, certain um, certain disease process, certain um, different things. But in general, just know that it's to prevent these things and prevent emesis. Um, complications are related to their class. So um, like dexamethasone is a glucocorticoid um, and uh, lorazepam, benzodiazepam. So you kind of look at those things um, briefly over or in your book. So it's just more related to the class, like those big major things. Um, but specifically, I wanted to bring to your attention on Dacitron, Zofran. Um, can cause a headache, uh, diarrhea, dizziness, and can cause a prolonged QT interval or other serious dysrhythmias. We use it so frequently that um, we forget sometimes that because we use it so frequently, we just give it. We just give it with opioids. We give it with everything just to prevent nausea. Um, but we really do need to be monitoring them, especially um, if they've never had it before or if they are in an acutely ill state, this is more gonna be at risk for them to develop these dysrhythmias. Um, so you really need to have um, anything available, just in case. Um, so administering early is gonna be the key in order to prevent the nausea. Um, just like with pain, you always wanna treat early um, before you get to that point, because once you get, hit a certain point, it's hard to come back from. Um, dexamethasone, being that glucocorticoid, you're going to have to be tapered off. You don't stop those um, immediately, and you can't have live vaccines with it because, again, with the glucocorticoid, you have the um, immunocompromised state. So, again, it's all related back to its um, classification. So, education we want to give these clients are to avoid alcohol and opioid, um, and they want to rinse uh, slowly. I mean, rise slowly, <laughs> rise slowly in order to prevent hypotension. So we usually give this along with an opioid. And so that's it, the thing here. So um, like we'll give it with morphine or we've even diluted it with morphine um, just to mix it. Um, so be careful when we do that because then you're more likely to have those cardiac dysrhythmias. Um, it's best to always give medicine separately and flush in between. Um, but specifically, Zofran on Dacitron can actually cause hypotension on itself without the opioid there um, and can also cause anticholinergic effects. So like that dry mouth constipation, things like that. So they can sip water and ice chips, um, suck on those sugarless gum and um, candies and things like that that we've talked about before with anticholinergics. So um, this one kind of just plays into all things that we've already kind of gone over. So just don't forget those high points of the little ones, okay? <clears throat> okay, so the next group are gonna be laxatives. This is gonna include docusate sodium. You see that often to try and promote um, bowel movements in patients that are on like opioids or long-term um, opioid use or after surgery, just to kind of jump start back that um, GI tract. Um, then there's like the biscuit deal, magnesium hydroxide, senna. Senna is also used for chronic opioid use. Um, and then lactulose. Lactulose we'll see in like liver patients or patients with hyperkalemia in order to promote bowel movements in order to get out the electrolytes that we don't want. So um, like the potassium and the bilirubin and things like that. And so we want all of that to come out of them quickly to drop those levels quickly. So we'll make them have these diarrhea movements by giving them lactulose. <clears throat> um, so these can be either bulk forming. Um, so trying to combine it all in order to get it out all at once or surfactant 
producing. So that's like the lubricant, like you have the surfactant around your lung, the lubrication, there's surfactant in the GI tract. Um, so if we produce more lubricant, it's more likely to come out. Um, then you have uh, some of these stimulate peristalsis. So if we're moving it more, then it's more likely to come out. And then osmotic drawing water, so that's going to pull the water into um, the GI tract in order to dilute the stool in order for the to be thinner, and thinner will hopefully push it out easier. So these are all due to constipation. So complications are going to be GI irritation, of course, because you're just changing everything up in there. Um, rectal burning which is called proctitis. So, um, I mean, just the acid buildup of all that. Um, diarrhea, just think of this as diarrhea. I mean, that's what we're making them do is have a diarrhea bowel movement. And so that acid buildup is gonna burn and irritate um, your rectum. Uh, sodium absorption and fluid retention. Um, and so we need to watch for dehydration and obstruction. So, um, if we're trying to push it out, push it out, and it's still not coming, then we need to look at obstruction. So we need to be careful because we are hyper stimulating the GI tract. Um, and so we don't want to give these to patients that have fecal impaction, nausea, cramping, abdominal pain, ulcerative colitis, and diverticulitis um, because there's already something going on wrong with the GI tract. It's not working correctly and so we don't want to hyperactivate the GI tract which is not working so it's just going to make it worse um so we don't want to do it in those cases and of course we need to monitor those electrolytes especially with chronic use um like I was talking about with the latulose so we're creating making them have a um, diarrhea movement so you're going to lose your electrolytes so they need to um, take with eight ounces of water um, increase their fiber intake and increase their fluid intake to two to three liters a day just to prevent that dehydration um, and maybe promote an exercise regimen in order to keep their peristalsis and um, GI motility active um, and therefore improving their bowel and function maybe be on a regular schedule again without the need for chronic laxative use okay so anti-diarrhea so these are the opposites so they're the patients having diarrhea so we want to bulk it up so we're going to look at these medicines are going to be diphenoxalate and atropine those are together in one medicine um, and then at uh, paramide and then paragoric i've only really been familiar with the first one um, so these are going to activate the opioid receptors to decrease motility. Remember, opioids, common problem is constipation. So these act on the same receptors of those in the GI tract, but not the CNS. Um, but so they're going to activate the same ones in the GI uh, to decrease that motility and increase absorption of fluid and sodium in the intestine. And so hopefully not dry out everything in there because everything is going to be very acidic. Um, complications with high doses, they um, can cause opioid effects though, uh, and atropine can cause blurred vision, dried mouth, urinary retention, constipation, tachycardia. So that's like those anticholinergic effects. So we we'll really need to watch out for those um, complications there. Um, nursing considerations, they're at increased risk for megacolon. So this is a pretty bad condition. Um, so with clients with inflammatory bowel disease disorders, they're at more risk for this um, and could lead to perforation. So we want to make sure that we're monitoring, doing your abdominal assessment um, pretty often, asking about their bowel movements. Um, of course, we want them to decrease the amount of bowel movements because this is for diarrhea, but we want to make sure that they are still having not completely stopped having bowel movements because um, we want to make sure the abdomen doesn't get firm to the touch because perforation um, then all that leaks into the abdomen and you have that firm abdomen feel for an infection going on called your stomach contents they're now in your abdominal cavity um, so for these patients we want to monitor their weight their eyes and o's 
especially O's, um, their vital signs because of the atropine use, um, and then administer a hypotonic solution for rehydration. So these, of course, if you have one or two episodes of diarrhea, it's not a big deal. You can usually recover. So these are patients that are, for some reason, have really bad feedback bug or um, side effect of a medication, and they're just having chronic diarrhea. So think of these as chronic diarrhea. So the chronic diarrhea patients are going to be dehydrated. So we want to rehydrate them, and, um, and the best solutions for those are going to be the hypotonic solutions to rehydrate those cells as fast as possible. So that's going to be half normal saline. So that's um, seen as 0.45% sodium chloride, but we call it just half normal saline. Okay. Their education for these clients are going to avoid alcohol and other CNS depressants because we don't want it acting on that um, receptor doubly. Um, we want to monitor, of course, for dehydration and rehydrate with clear liquids or oral electrolyte solutions, not water. Water is not going to replace those electrolytes that they're vastly getting rid of. So water is not going to be effective for rehydration on these patients. Again, think of chronic, not just one or two times that you've had diarrhea, just drink some water and you didn't rehydrate. These are chronic diarrhea patients, okay? So also they need to avoid caffeine because caffeine promotes de dehydration, okay? So dehydration. All right, next group are the prokinetic agents or agent, which is um, metaclopramide. Um, these block dopamine and serotonin receptors to reduce the stimulus to empty the bowels um, and also increases upper GI motility to increase peristalsis. Uh, so this means that they are trying to prevent them from going as often but still want to keep it going. Um, so it may not be diarrhea, it just be maybe that they've had multiple bowel movements in a day and that all these bowel movements, they're just increased irritation to the rectum or having, um, what's it called, um, hemorrhoids. And so exacerbating their hemorrhoids. And so they might... Um, put on one of these medications at least for a short time in order to relieve some of that um, distress back there. Um, these are constantly indicated, of course, with anything that's going wrong with the GI tract. So perforation, bleeding, bowel obstruction, or hemorrhage. Um, opioids and anticholinergics um, can decrease the, uh, the effects because they're acting on the same receptors again. So um, these ones, though, we're going to need to monitor for EPS symptoms, so antarctic dyskinesia and sedation, um, and then diarrhea. So it's a little backwards in my brain. Um, we can give this IV if we need to. Sorry, my nose is very itchy right now. Um, we can give it IV if we need to, um, 10 milligrams. We would give it an uh, IV push over two minutes. But if we're going to need to give more than 10 milligrams, then we're going to need to dilute it in 50 milliliters and give it over 15 minutes. And that can be diluted in D5W, normal saline, or lactated ringers. Um, doesn't really matter. But um, so the importance there is the 10 milligrams uh, cutoff. So 10 milligrams you can push slowly over two minutes undiluted. But once you're more than 10 milligrams, it's important to dilute it because it can be very irritating to the vein and cause um, even more risk for those uh, complications. So education we're going to give these patients are going to be to avoid alcohol and CNS depressants, which is really education for any person on the street. Um, but in specifically to these um, type of medications are because they can lead to seizures and sedation. Um, so sedation is already a complication, and then you add a CNS depressant, it's going to be even more sedation, so it's that doubled effect. But um, the seizure activity is the interesting thing here, okay? Um, I think of kinetic as like kinesthesia, so movement, so seizure. So if that helps you, you're welcome. All right, irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, there's the irritable bowel syndrome diarrhea, and then there's irritable bowel syndrome 
Um, <laughs> sorry, I just looked at a message. Um, and then there's another type that we'll get into on the next slide. So for diarrhea type irritable bowel syndrome, their medication is going to be uh, elocitron. So this is going to increase the firmness of the stool and decreases the urgency and frequency for the need of the IBM. So again, they're going multiple times a day, but um, it may not necessarily be loose. It's just very irritating. And so um, these are are usually given to patients that have already been diagnosed with this um, process, disease process, for greater than six months, and um, they've tried other things and been resistant to that management. Um, so this is kind of like the last treatment option for them. We can try this medication. Complication, of course, is going to be constipation because we're increasing that firmness of the stool, so it might get blocked up. Um, contraindicated for chronic constipation. So if they go back and forth, then they can't really be on this medicine. It has to be just the diarrhea type irritable bowel syndrome. And then if they've ever had a obstruction before, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, any other kind of GI issues, um, then of course we don't really want to give these to these patients. Um, another interesting thing here that they've added is the thrombophlebitis though. So if they've ever had thrombophlebitis, they should not take this medication. I'm not really sure why that is. Um, but we're going to go with it because your book says it. Um, education is going to be that they actually need to sign an agreement because this is a last option kind of treatment. Um, agreeing to the risk versus the benefit of these medications. Um, and that other education is that it's going to take about four to six weeks for your symptoms to resolve. But if they stop taking it, their symptoms are going to return within one week. So this is going to be a long term management thing that they have to really sign up for and be dedicated to. Okay. State other type of air ball syndrome is constipation um, type medication. This is going to be the lubifostone. So I think of it lube as in like lubricant in order to help the constipated bowel movement move out. Um, so the purpose is going to be increasing that fluid secretion like a lubricant um, in the intestine to promote intestinal motility. Um, complications are going to be diarrhea because you're pushing it out um, and nausea. Um, considerations are going to be constant intricated, of course, bowel obstructions, just like all of these. Um, and then educate to take with food. Um, to decrease that uh, nausea effect, um, which kind of seems a little contradictory, but um, it will actually help promote the um, peristalsis and therefore move it along and not feel so overwhelming to the GI tract, and so it will reduce that nausea effect. Okay, inflammatory bowel disease medications. Um, these are going to be the hydrocortisone and metrodenazole. Um, you'll see the metrodenazole a lot. Um, the purpose of these ones are going to be to decrease the inflammation related to Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. So if you decrease that inflammation in the bowel, then they might be more likely to have a more regular bowel regimen. Um, complications are going to be blood disorder, so we're going to look um, for anemia, um, watching their CBC frequently, um, and we're also going to look for nausea, fever, rash, um, and arthralgia, so that's pain in the joints. Um, these patients can also develop the crystal urea, which are those little particles in your urine, um, can cause um, the kidney damage that we talked about in the previous lecture, um, but they can also bulk up those little pieces can form a calculi, so renal uh, renal calculi like a kidney stone from those little particles. Um, so we need to monitor their CBC, like I said, look for anemia and any other blood disorders. Um, these are constant indicated if they already have a sensitivity to sulfa, salicylates, so like aspirin, or thiazides, because um, they're kind of act this a, a very similar way. And so if they already have an allergy to one of those medications, they should not be taking these medications. Um, we need to be taking caution, giving these to patients with liver or kidney disease or um, blood dyscrasia. 
Um, we need to educate them to notify their primary doctor for any of these symptoms that we listed in the complications and to take the food or after meals. Um, it just absorbs better that way um, and has a better effect. The, um, they also need to increase their fluid intake in order to prevent that crystal urea and prevent that kidney damage okay? and calculi. Okay, hiatal hernia medications. So a hiatal hernia can cause, can be the underlying cause of a lot of the reflux and um, ulcerative or hypersecretory disorders. And so we're gonna treat these with proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole and antacids like aluminum hydroxide. So these are just kinda gonna be a repeat, but just more focused on hiatal hernia. So the purpose are gonna be um, dependent on the class that you're using for the, um, the hiatal hernia. Um, and then of course, to reduce the manifestations of heartburn, belching and dysphagia. Um, probiotics and dietary supplements. Um, these are going to treat irritable bowel syndrome, ulcerative colitis, and C. diff associated diarrhea and rotavirus diarrhea in children. Um, complications can include flatulence and bloating, infection in clients that already have immunocompromised states. And so these um, probiotics like we discussed before, need to be taken two hours apart from any other antibiotics or antifungals. Okay, so the last group of medications from uh, chapter 30 in your ATI book are vitamins and minerals. These um, vitamins and minerals have different roles in their body, and so we'll go into detail about each one of them specifically, but um, it's important to know that deficiencies can increase risk for health problems. So then, of course, the goal is to decrease and prevent those risks of those health problems. Okay, so iron supplements. You're going to see ferrous sulfate, ferrous gluconate, and iron sucrose. And there's some other ones listed in your book, but those are the more common ones. Um, so iron um, is needed for red blood cell development and oxygen transport. Um, so poorly uh, taken PO, it is poorly absorbed. So typically these patients are going to need to take large amounts in order to actually have the effect that we want, which is then to increase their hemoglobin hematocrit um, due to the anemia that they have. Um, so this treats the primary or secondary anemia or deficiency. So primary anemia is that they just don't have the production of the red blood cells to transport the oxygen and secondarily that they have a GI um, malabsorption disorder. And therefore, because of that, they're not absorbing as much iron that leads to the decreased transport. So that's just what it means to be a primary or secondary anemia or deficiency there. Um, but the underlying reason is that they are not getting as much iron as they need. Um, so complications of giving iron supplements are going to be GI distress, so nausea, constipation, and heartburn. Specifically, that constipation, the stool is going to be um, dark and tarry, um, and that's a normal side effect. It's not really a complication, a, a, a complication but um, just to note that because um, it was not listed in your book, but they will have dark, tarry stools, and that's going to be normal. It's not from a bead. Um, iron supplements can stain their teeth in the liquid form. And um, if given IM, that area can, um, that it leaks into the subcutaneous area, which happens, um, that can stain that whole area of that arm um, temporarily as well. Um, they can have anaphylaxis to the dextran. Um, there's a um, ferrous dextran or iron dextran or whatever. So it's really an allergy to the dextran. It's not really an allergy to the iron. So it's only that one type that they can really be have an allergic reaction to because your body lives with iron. So you can't be allergic to iron. Um, iron can cause hypotension. So a drop in blood pressure. Um, and they, we can also have an iron toxicity, which can be fatal. So this is when we're looking at um, like a dose of like two to 10 grams, which is entirely too much. Um, so we wanna give this IV only if the patient cannot swallow, it's best to be absorbed through the GI tract. Um, 
And if we have to give it um, not through the GI tract, IV is preferred over the IM route, um, but we need to uh, infuse it over slow infusion and have epinephrine and life support available, which was new to me because I've given iron and thought nothing of it. But um, of course, um, if you have that issue, then you might need epinephrine um, to give for a reaction or um, that uh, hypotension that can drop their blood pressure and that epinephrine can possibly save their life if you have it really, readily available. Um, caution with liver disease um, patients with iron, they just don't absorb it um, effectively. Um, food, caffeine, dairy, and acids and tetracyclines interfere with the absorption of iron. And so you need to monitor the timing again when we take these supplements. Um, and then we're going to monitor their hemoglobin um, and their fatigue and their pallor, which would be the symptoms of the anemia that we're trying to treat. So we want those to increase uh, their hemoglobin and decrease their manifestations like the fatigue and pallor. Um, education is to take on an empty stomach if tolerable because, again, it interacts with um, other medications. And then taking with food decreases the absorption effect. Um, but if it causes GI distress, then, of course, the only way to get it in them, then they can eat with it. Um, they need to equally space it out, their, um, their doses of iron, so that there's a continued effect because it's only, it's like short term. And so once it takes effect and then it promotes the red blood cell to production and then you have red blood cells, red blood cells don't live for very long. So then you need another one to keep producing that red blood cells. And so it needs to be equally spaced out so you can have that continued effect. Um, if we are giving it in a liquid form, that it needs to be diluted with water or juice. Um, it tastes awful is the reason why, in my opinion. Um, it's very, very bad um, tasting. So usually orange juice masks it the best. Um, and to use a straw because it stains their teeth um, and then rinse their mouth. So it's like a three-part process. So they're walking in there and telling them, no, you need this, but I'm going to warn you, it's going to not taste great, but we're going to mix it in this orange juice real quick and you're going to take it as a shot with a straw, shot or straw, but they say straw. Um, I'm assuming because they're mixing it with a small amount, um, I would give it with a little bit more and then just take it like a shot. Um, and when you take it like a shot, you're not really leaving it in your mouth to stain your teeth. But anyways, um, and then to rinse their mouth so that it doesn't leave that staining effect. Um, increasing their water and fiber intake because of the problem of constipation um, with the iron supplements. So yeah, constipation um, and it tastes bad. Okay. So vitamin B12 supplements, it's going to be vitamin B12, or intranasally, um, you'll see cyanocobalamin. I've only seen that in like pediatrics. Um, so the purpose is going to be to convert that folic acid into an active form for DNA production. And deficiencies of vitamin B12 can lead to anemias, dysrhythmias, and loss of all types of blood cells from the bone marrow. So just similar to the previous one. Um, complications are going to be hypokalemia, slow potassium levels, okay, um, with taking the supplement, not the deficiency. That's the thing with these guys to remember that they're taking this because they have a deficiency. So it's the medicine causing the complication, not the deficiency of these complications. So remember, we're talking about medications, not disease processes, okay? So taking vitamin B12, you can have developed, you can develop low potassium levels. Oh, that was hard to say. Um, okay, so considerations, um, severe anemia requires B12 and folic acid, so they work together. That's how it works is it converts the folic acid. So you can get an increased effect um, especially with the severe anemias, um, if you give them both together. Um, 
IM injections are quite painful, and so they are the last resort. We would rather um, give this to them via pills or the intranasal one hour before or after eating um, hot foods. So the hot foods um, is kind of interesting, and I read a little bit about it, was um, the temperature of your meal um, can is hot, and so if it's hot, it tries to get rid of the steam, so it breathe, you breathe it out. So then you're breathing out the medicine that you just put in your nose. And so actually you won't get all of what you're trying to absorb into your intranasal, your mucosa. And so the purpose of that is that to not eat hot meals within one hour of taking, um, using your intranasal spray. Um, they need to adhere to consistent lab testing because this is usually due to a severe anemia. And so they usually will get tested every three to six months. Um, and this is usually a long-term therapy. Sometimes um, patients will just um, be on an IM regimen. So they'll get an IM injection every three months or six months um, after they get their lab drawn and then they just get a shot or others will just be on the pills. Um, so your book says that I am is the last resort, but in most cases that I've ever seen vitamin B12 has been I am. Okay, so folic acid supplements. Um, folic acid uh, is going to be folic acid. This is uh, going to pr um, promote DNA production and erythropoiesis, so increasing all those um, bone marrow type. Um, production of cells, like in the last one. Um, so treats anemia secondary to deficiencies, um, prevents neural tube defects during pregnancy is the big thing that you'll see, especially in your mother baby class later, um, preventing neural tube defects. And that's what mainly is, um, if you look at a prenatal vitamin, you're going to see a lot of folic acid in it. And so that's the main thing. It's like a prenatal vitamins have like your normal daily vitamin supplements but then like compared to regular vitamin supplements your folic acid is like a lot and so that was is the whole purpose of the prenatal vitamins is that they have that extra amount of folic acid in there so it prevents that defect um being um present during development of the fetus um of that neural tube defect um <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> uh and it can also be a supplement for alcohol use disorder. So um, clients that um, have alcohol abuse disorder, they can have, oh, okay. <clears throat> they have a decreased level of folic acid. Um, so complications of taking folic acid supplements is that it's gonna mask um, a vitamin B12 deficiency because remember they're kind of taken together and so if folic acid is overused they may not notice that the patient also has a vitamin B12 deficiency and so both need to be monitored closely. Um, we need to assess for megaloblastic anemia so this is seen as pallor fatigue palpitations um, but this one is specific because uh, against all the other types of anemias in the paresthesias, the hands and feet. Okay, um, so we need to monitor for those. And then we need to um, have, of course, baseline folic acid levels, um, hemoglobin hematocrit, red blood cells, and reticulocyte counts. Um, throughout their therapy. Um, they need to increase food sources of folic acid, like liver, because everyone likes to eat liver. Um, green leafy vegetables, citrus fruits, and dried peas and beans um, that can increase their folic acid. Okay, potassium supplements. We're getting close. Um, potassium supplements, you're going to see this potassium chloride, potassium gluconate, potassium phosphate, bicarb net bicarbonate it's a whole word um but they're all just for potassium um i used to think that certain ones were for different reasons but they all still increase your potassium because it's using potassium um so 
they're going to be used to con uh, as conductive um, purposes on um, your nerve impulses. Um, so promoting that electrical activity. Because remember, a lot of potassium complications end up with cardiac dysrhythmias. Um, and so you need that electrical activity and you need that potassium to promote that electrical activity. Um, also maintaining the electrical excitability of muscles. So not just your heart, but like all your muscles require potassium to move and regulation of acid base balance. Um, so you're going to use these to treat, of course, hypokalemia, so low potassium levels due to, um, could be due to diuretics, like we've talked about before, or prolonged um, vomiting and diarrhea, laxative use, um, intestinal drainage, or GI fistula. When you're getting rid of all of that, like we talked about a little while ago with laxatives, you're getting rid of a lot of your electrolytes. And so we may need to supplement them, especially potassium, um, because it's going to bring your potassium out very quickly um, when you have diarrhea. Complications are going to be GI ulceration um, or distress and hyperkalemia because, of course, it's a fine line with potassium. Um, so we need to monitor for hyperkalemia symptoms. Um, caution in patients with chronic kidney disease or hypoaldosteronism. Um, there are powdered and effervescent forms of potassium, but if you use these, I haven't ever seen these in practice, but your book talks about mixing it with 90 to 240 milliliters of cold water. That just seems like a lot to force the patient to drink, um, but then they have to drink it slowly over five to 10 minutes. They can't like chug it. Um, mostly I've seen potassium supplements as an IV infusion. Um, so this is gonna be at a very controlled and slow rate through a very large bore IV. Never, never, never do we push potassium. IV push will never happen. It can cause severe cardiac dysrhythmia. The electrolyte the cell changes that happens just directly at the IV site can be very irritating um, to the site, can cause thrombophobitis very quickly, very easily. Um, and usually it, this is diluted a lot in um, like D5W or something like that. Um, and so you need to assess your IV site for irritation, phobitis and infiltration frequently during that infusion. Infusion could take one hour. I've seen some potassium um, supplements that they needed so much potassium that they had to dilute it over so much that it ran over six hours. Um, so it just depends on how much potassium, but they, it is diluted. It is a slow rate. It is a controlled rate. It is not pushed. Okay, we need to monitor the I's and O's for their output to make sure that they maintain at least 30 milliliters an hour of output so that um, we're looking for um, any problems um, with that hypoaldosteronism um, or chronic kidney disease to make sure that there's no issue to their kidneys that's going on that we're not finding out about now that we're giving them potassium supplements. Um, so we need to make sure that they're still kicking out urine. Okay. Minimum 30 milliliters an hour per hour, per hour. Um, okay, so education we're going to give with meals or eight ounces of water to reduce, oops, GI effects. That's supposed to be GI effects. Um, no, notify their PMD if they have difficulty swallowing the pills because these are usually those big, large horse pills, they call them. Um, if um, they have a little score on them, then yeah, we can break them. Sometimes we break them anyways just because they are so big and it's easier for them to take because sometimes they're having to take two or three of these large horse pills just for their supplement. Um, sometimes with this minute hypokalemia, we can give them just a couple of horse pills and they'll be fine. But if it is severe hyper hypok, then um, of course, we have the risk of all of these dysrhythmias and problems going on, so we do want to give them. Sometimes they'll get PO and IV. All right, magnesium sulfate. Um, so magnesium sulfate, magnesium hydroxide, magnesium oxide, and magnesium citrate. Um, so some of these are uh, used to as an laxative. So just 
but you know, low doses, they can act as an antacid. Um, some of them act as laxatives. Um, they can treat or prevent, of course, hypothyroidism. Um, in pregnant um, patients, we can give it IV to stop preterm labor or um, to prevent seizures during labor and delivery phases. Um, you'll see that again later in your mother baby course. So magnesium sulfate is definitely a drug for you to know. Um, so it stops preterm labor and um, prevents seizure activity during labor and delivery. Um, very important drug. Uh, so complications are going to be muscle weakness, <laughs> flaccid paralysis. So like they're just not just paralysis stuck in one position stiff. So they're like actually like flaccid paralysis, <laughs> painful muscle contractions, uh, uh, suppression of AV abduction through the heart. So someone can have some dyspnea's here um, and respiratory depression. So this one can get pretty bad. So this one needs to be, of course, monitored pretty closely. And of course, diarrhea, because some of them act as laxatives and get rid of, therefore, a lot of the electrolytes. If you haven't noticed a trend yet, you should. Um, so considerations are going to be contraindicated, of course, if they already have an AV um, block. So uh, an issue with the AV node conducting. So we don't want to use it with those patients because the already concern for that complication. Don't want to use it in patients with rectal bleeding, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, renal or cardiac disease, um, or within two hours of child delivery, which is weird because we might give it to stop preterm labor. But if they continue to have their baby, it doesn't stop preterm labor, and they have a preterm labor, then it just happens. But we hope to not have it within two hours of child delivery because it can move on to the, the newborn and have other complications. And we'll get into in mother baby time. But um, so it's a little weird. Um, assess for depressed or absent deep tendon reflexes. So you need to be hitting those little spots in the knees and elbows in order to make sure that they still have their reflexes because that's going to be the first thing. Um, they might still be moving around, but you'll, those reflexes might um, not be as present. Um, so you need to be monitoring that um, because it would be kind of like the first sign that this paralysis might start taking over. Um, you know, of course, monitor their magnesium and calcium and phosphorus levels because they all kind of follow each other. And then, of course, their vital signs, their blood pressure, heart rate, and respiratory rate because it does have respiratory depression in this one, which is new and different from any of the other ones. Um, and have available calcium gluconate, calcium gluconate for toxicity. So this is like the antidote. So if there's too much magnesium sulfate, we need calcium gluconate try and come up with something to remember that by but calcium gluconate you're going to need handy and available okay education you're going to increase their diet in of magnesium so some of these are going to be the whole grain cereals nuts legumes because legumes are yummy no, i don't like legumes i don't know why i just said that um green leafy vegetables because that's just has everything in it um and bananas because that has white berries in it too. Um, so yeah, increasing their diet in magnesium, of course, will help with the hypomagnesium because they are in need of magnesium. All right, so this concludes the lecture on GI medications. Um, this again was found in your ATI book on pages 219 to 39. So chapters... 28, 29, and 30. Um, I will be available on the discussion board for any further questions. And I hope you guys have a great week.